welcome everyone to this episode of The Next Page. And this episode is actually part two of an episode with Adam Day, who is today back in the studio together with me to deep dive into the fundamental transformative shifts proposed by the INDA report, A Breakthrough for People and Planet, which is issued last year by the high-level advisory board on effective multilateralism created by the Secretary General to look into the challenges of bringing multilateralism to the next level. And it's connected, of course, to the summit of the future due to occur in September 24 in New York. So, Adam, welcome back. Last time in the previous episode, you spoke about the first three shifts, rebuilding trust in multilateralism, planet and people, and number three was global finance. And in this episode, we're going to deep dive into the next three fundamental shifts, digital and data governance, peace and prevention, anticipatory action. So for those who have not gone through the first episode, I recommend that they go and listen to that. So let's start, let's continue and dive in directly straight into it uh, with shift four, digital and data governance. Yeah, thanks, Francesco. It's good to be back. I think the starting point for shift four really is that there's already a lot of ongoing work in digital space. So the board was being very careful to try to do something complementary, for example, to the Global Digital Compact process, which is a formal process being led by the UN Tech Envoy out of New York. And so I think in this area, there are some quite ambitious proposals, but I think it's also very important to understand that this is a kind of parallel set of recommendations for an ongoing process and a way to inform and maybe shape that process a bit. Whereas in some of the other shifts, they were trying to do something a bit more standalone. And I think one of the key starting points for the board to take on this issue is that the digital transformation is one of those very fast moving processes where it could be an enabler for achieving a lot of the SDGs, but there are a lot of risks as well. There's a risk of increasing inequality. There's a risk of people being left behind or excluded. There's obviously the risk of kind of a splinter net, a fracture of digital space where some people would get the benefits and other people wouldn't. So I think the underlying idea for all of their recommendations is to make the digital transformation something that's equitable and inclusive. And one of the initiatives that the board recommended was the creation of a global commission on just and sustainable digitalization. And so the idea here would be that to have an independent body that would be able to oversee a set of commitments around inclusive and sustainable digital space. And in many other areas, there are those ideas too throughout the report, throughout this whole process, where, for example, in the previous shift, one of the board's recommendations was to create an IPCC-like structure for the whole set of environmental challenges. Here again, you see the, the need for a global commission on just and sustainable digitalization, the need for something independent because there's so many vested interests in it. Another interesting point, and I think this will be taken up by the Global Digital Compact process, is really to expand the definition of threats to include more digital ones. Right now, there's a very fraught process where, for example, cyber threats, um, there's a, a disagreement amongst member states as to whether they'll be treated as exactly security threats within existing treaties or whether you need a new treaty or, or how will you define a threat on critical infrastructure. It's not military, but I think there's just a lot of fuzziness in this area. And so um, a process to create a kind of common understanding of digital threats and maybe even move towards that becoming norms or principles or even a code of conduct. I don't think the board was thinking of something legal here, but building out a better understanding of digital threats, I think, is an important one. And then I think the board also offers some principles that could guide the creation of this global digital compact. And one of the interesting things is, and I'll just refer back to the very beginning of this report, there are 10 principles that the board offers for effective multilateralism. I would say that those 10 would also apply in the digital space. And I think that that's one of the key points that the board is making is that the digital space can be treated with many of the same tools as multilateralism. And then the final um, area really is around data and the need to treat data also as a global public good, as something that needs to be common and beneficial for all and not a source of tension data can be used to improve transparency about risks. So for example, misinformation and disinformation, we need much more capacities there. And one of the initiatives that's kind of come out of this idea of a data impact hub, which is what the board has proposed, 
is a proposal that's kind of in the bloodstream right now for the summit of the future to announce an international decade of data. And those of you who follow the UN, there are lots of international decades of all kinds of things. And it may sound a little bit wonky or not that useful, but actually sometimes what an international decade can do is create a kind of dedicated period where member states always have a reference point for spending resources, for pushing initiatives. And I think that having an international decade on data would be a nice vehicle to say, you know, data needs to be something that promotes inclusivity. Data needs to be something that can be underpinning that push to represent future generations and their needs in the system. Data is going to be the thing that unlocks our shift to green energy, um, really, in many respects. And so I think that idea of an international decade of data may be actually quietly one of the more promising initiatives that's come kind of out of some of the discussions of the high-level advisory board and may end up landing in the summit, though we don't know yet whether it definitely will. So shift five is key, peace and prevention. And it's really right there, one of the pillars on which the UN is built. So I imagine that the report is very strong on this one. And I imagine that maybe the discussions were also leading to the report were also very interesting. Yeah, special attention on this one on my part. So let's go. Yeah, I mean... Maybe a starting point is to ask why it's number five and not number one. And I think there is a reason for that, or maybe two. One is it's probably the most important in many respects, but also one of the most difficult to land a concrete initiative. And we can go through what some of those are. Also, I think there's a recognition that there are many other formal processes for taking forward these kinds of peace and security proposals. So, for example, the Secretary General published his new agenda for peace uh, after this high-level advisory board report, but that's another important reference point. But things like Security Council reform and the Conference on Disarmament, these are all processes that have a certain formality to them that make it difficult. And so I completely agree, it, it's a super important topic. And so one of the interesting ways that I think the board frames this from the outset, and this is also, I want to mention the Olaf Palma Commission report of March 2022, which is called Common Security. And Olaf Palma um, really came, former prime minister of Sweden. The initial report was really in that nuclear moment 30, 40 years ago, where you suddenly realize that we're all in it together. A, a single nuclear threat is a threat to us all. And so again, coming back to that idea of a global public good, I think the High Level Advisory Board treats a kind of safe world, a nuclear safe world, a more peaceful world as a global public good, as something that we all need to invest in. And so the term they use is collective security. So this is a phrase that's in the UN Charter, but I think the meaning has shifted a bit. As our ability to destroy ourselves has increased, the notion of collective security has become more acute, and the responsibilities on us has become more serious. And so that can be nuclear, that can be biological weapons, that can be the pandemic, that can be AI. There's a whole range of ways in which we can really be detrimental to our collective security. So I think the starting point for the board's understanding of security is a collective, mutually beneficial one. And that may not resonate with people that are thinking about, you know, Gaza and Ukraine and Yemen, where it's highly contested. But I would say that the board members would insist on that as their initial definition, that we need to think of collective security arrangements. So then the specific um, proposals, there's a kind of cluster where the board recognizes the need to reform the Security Council. It doesn't offer a specific formula. It offers some guiding principles, including better representation of the global south. And that is a process where a few years ago, uh, President Biden announced a willingness for the U.S. to consider that. Um, but I think there's also recognition amongst the board that that's fairly unlikely to happen in the short term. So part of the, it said Security Council reform, and then right under that, it said, empower the General Assembly to do more on peace and security. Um, folks studying international relations will be aware of the 1950 Uniting for Peace resolution, where the General Assembly essentially gave itself the ability to act when the Security Council got stuck. I think there are a lot more other actions that the General Assembly can take, um, given how stuck the Security Council is. The Liechtenstein Initiative to make member states justify their use of the veto in the Security Council is a very interesting one. But the General Assembly has a long history of doing really interesting things that a lot of people aren't aware of. They can create envoys, they can create judicial processes, accountability mechanisms, there's a whole range of things. And what's interesting is pretty soon after the high-level advisory board report came out in the summer, the General Assembly actually passed a resolution called Revitalizing Its Mandate. They do that every two years, where they make reference to the creation of a digital handbook on its own practice. And I think this is members of the General Assembly realizing 
you know, we could be more active on peace and security. There's a whole range of practices that we should understand better. So I think there is a, a kind of realm of things around the General Assembly that's quite interesting. But then the third part of that recommendation is also about the Peace Building Commission. If you think about the Security Council as the apex actor on peace and security, the General Assembly is a very important actor that has issues on peace and security. The Peace Building Commission is something that has grown really ever since about the last 15, 16 years into a kind of important actor that is linked to the Security Council, somewhat subordinate to it. And I think the idea the board had here was we need to bolster and expand the work of the Peace Building Council to cover more issues like how climate affects security risks, how digital issues affect security risks, to give it more capacities. Similarly, I mean, those of you who listened to the first episode, that set of recommendations about empowering UNEP to make it more like the Human Rights Council set of capacities with rapporteurs and investigative capacities and maybe more funding links to the financial institutions too. Similar set of ideas around the Peace Building Commission. Could you have a bigger, stronger, more capacitated Peace Building Commission to really pick up the slack uh, for the UN system? And what's interesting here is there is an entry point for this. So last fall, there was a ministerial statement out of the General Assembly that called for or recognized the need to bolster the PBC, as it's called, the Peace Building Commission. Next year, 2025, is going to be the Peace Building Architecture Review, which is a kind of formal process to think about what changes need to happen. And the Summit of the Future does have a peace and security pillar where this issue could be taken up. So I think this idea is a quite tangible idea about how to improve a specific bit of the UN. And I always fall back on a piece that was the Common Agenda Director Michelle Griffin gave me when we were thinking about what kinds of recommendations get taken up. And what she said, and she's covered this for the last 20 years, when member states are offered very ambitious, costly, difficult proposals, and then some lower architectural or reform proposals, they always gravitate to those easier to grip, you know, adding some capacities to an existing. I think this reform of the Peace Building Commission falls exactly in that sweet spot, something member states can see, understand, support, get traction on. So I, I would imagine that one will get some traction. It's also in the new agenda for peace. And then the other, the other recommendations that the High Level Advisory Board put forward, this idea of a collective security framework with regional organizations. I think one of the key words in the High Level Advisory Board is this idea of networked multilateralism. How do you create a more strategic relationship with regional organizations so that they take on more of the peace and security work and are capacitated? The most important regional organization for the UN is the African Union. Um, but one of the ideas that the High Level Advisory Board had was there was a three-prong approach used to create the OSCE in Europe. And it meant that the OSCE was created not just around security, but also development and human rights. It was a much deeper strategy. So using that model for the UN to create relationships with regional organizations would mean you don't just have a security relationship with the AU or with ASEAN or with other regional organizations. You'd have one that recognizes that broader set of issues that need to be part of your common strategy. So I think building out of that collective security idea came that proposal. I think the other main idea um, that the board put forward is really over the last 10 years or so, we've seen a kind of reduction and withdrawal from many of the forums where member states could exchange information around militarization and security. I'm guessing none of the listeners here have heard of UNMILEX or UNROCA, which are the military arms registries of the UN, but they're really falling into disuse. And they may not be that visible, but they were important ways for member states to build confidence around each other's military capacities and intentions. The most high profile example of this is the START Treaty between the US and Russia, which even though it wasn't necessarily preventing them from going to a strategic level war, it was did provide a forum for exchange of information around weapons. So one of the key recommendations the board put forward was we need a multi-stakeholder transparency platform that would allow member states and others to really share and vet information around military risks and threats. And that could be replicated at the regional level too, where you could imagine the AU being capacitated a bit more around that. And then there are a set of really strong and ambitious recommendations around nuclear use um, and really ending nuclear weapons. These are quite unlikely to land in the short term. I think it's absolutely insane that we're sitting at 90 seconds to midnight on the doomsday clock, and, and there aren't more initiatives on this. But I think one of the, the innovations that the board put forward that I don't see in many other reports is a clarification and expansion of the no first use policy. 
accompanied by confidence building measures. Like right now, only two countries have publicly said no first use is their policy. And other countries are less willing to sign on to that because they don't trust each other. The major nuclear powers have very low levels of trust. But if you could build in some measures where you could verify how is that no first use policy being implemented domestically? How far away is one person's finger from the red button that's going to shoot a nuclear weapon off? Gradually, I think you could build towards a better set up for nuclear weapons. And that's certainly one of the ideas that's not only in the HLAB report, but also in the new agenda for peace. Yeah, after this description, really one wonders why this was not shift one. Well, I mean, the order of things doesn't necessarily reflect their priority. But I think one issue is that when you're thinking about global governance and the role of the multilateral system, some of the most ambitious reforms and kind of the spine that runs through this whole report is how are you going to pay for it? And that's why the financial system is quite important. Similarly, the kind of landscape on which all of this is going to happen is the environment. And if we get the environment wrong, all of our security, human security risks go way up. And then I think the reason for having the first shift as the first shift was really it was less about a substantive area and more about how global governance is done. So I think that is part of the reason. It could also have to do with the, the expertise of the board members. Many of them were um, really chosen because of their very deep expertise on the financial issues in particular and digital too. But I also think that is a feeling amongst many of us, and I'm speaking personally now not for the board, that it's just so hard to get anything formally done on security right now that making it your big ticket, you know, blinking headlights issue may be dooming you to a little bit of unfulfilled expectations. So that would be my personal view about a choice of where to put it. Sounds good to me too. Um, let's go to the last shift, number six, anticipatory action. And this is all about looking at, um, or the way our capacity is to look at current and emerging transnational risks. Yeah. And I think this shift, it's only number six because it's a bit of a catch-all of emerging risks. I think it's actually, if you look across for example, the Secretary General's common agenda. That report was written during COVID and at a time where I think the Secretary General was quite frustrated at how difficult it was to knock heads together to get everybody aligned around a common response to COVID. And I think that a lot of the initiatives around emerging risks comes from that feeling of we need to be better prepared to pre-position resources and decision making for the next big crisis. And so one of the proposals that the Secretary General has made in his common agenda is about the creation of an emergency platform, which would be a kind of protocol that would preposition resources in some decisions if another pandemic or if another global threat happened, maybe another big financial shock or another crisis. And so I do think that that idea of preparedness and not always lagging behind the next emerging risk is extremely important to this board's report. It also has to do with the future generations aspect. But I, I think also... One of the frustrations with formal multilateralism is how slow it moves and how long it takes to get a small change. I mean, the IPCC has been talking about human-caused climate change for 30 years, and we still haven't stopped fossil fuel use. There's a sense of there's just too much lag in the slow-moving bureaucracy of multilateralism to deal with something as fast-moving as AI, and AI is certainly the one that's on everybody's minds right now. So that's the kind of framework for Shift 6. The specific ideas. I think there's a set of kind of strengthening our ability to respond to climate-driven security risks. I would say that the board really wrote that idea knowing that the new agenda for peace was going to make some specific recommendations too. So if, if I were reading that recommendation, think of them as puzzle pieces that fit together with the new agenda for peace, which has more specific things about creation of regional climate security hubs. But I think there's a growing recognition that climate change, environmental change, is having an indirect but clear causal relationship on instability and insecurity. And that can be through livelihood loss or displacement or all kinds of other uh, kind of causal pathways, but that we need to grip that more seriously. The second one is actually um, a recommendation that was essentially poached from a previous report. And I use the word poached because it was by the same person, so I'm allowed to say that. So Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was the co-chair of the high-level advisory board. She was also the co-chair of a previous high-level body that created a set of recommendations around the pandemic response. And one of the recommendations in that was the call to create a global pandemic threats council 
plus some monitoring capacities. Very important recommendation. It's, it's you know, in the background of the discussions that are happening in Geneva around a pandemic treaty. What are the capacities to deal with that? And the board really thought this was an important idea that needed to be reaffirmed in this context. And so it was great that Alan Johnson Sirleaf had served on both panels. She really had the authority to speak to this issue. I think that's one of the recommendations that that kind of has a pathway that goes from before the high-level advisory board, hopefully, to this process that's going on. But it's also, there isn't a seventh shift that's focused on health. Um, and you would imagine something coming out of COVID, there might be. This is really the health-focused recommendation. Similarly, there was a call for a global agreement on biorisk monitoring and a common scientific process. Now, biorisks you can think of as having two kind of pathways. One is military you know, the creation of biohazards. There's the biological weapons issue. That's one. There's also the, the kind of bio risks where you have another COVID starting and you need an early capacity to deal with that. There's a very interesting recommendation um, that Angela Kane at the Nuclear Threat Initiative put forward about a dedicated capacity for dealing with biological risks of unknown origin. The board really took that to heart as one of the important recommendations. One of the decisions the board made was to try not to recommend too many new institutions. So they didn't fully endorse that idea. But I think behind the scenes is the need to have a better capacity to understand the origin and potential risks of biological hazards. And I'd recommend um, listeners to look at that recommendation by the Nuclear Threat Initiative. It's very interesting and I think does have quite a lot of support among some member states. There's another recommendation the board made on AI governance. And I think this is really important. One of the most interesting things is we were playing the secretariat role. The UN University was playing the secretariat role to this board. And so we were receiving hundreds of ideas from civil society. We did 21 roundtables. We had a portal where hundreds were sent in. And there was a high school student in Singapore named Jason Hausenloy who sent a recommendation in that the AI risks, the emerging AI risks needed to be dealt with via an institution like the IAEA, like the organization that deals with um, power nuclear weapons. And that idea, that recommendation was initially discussed very seriously by the board. And again, they took the decision not to formally say we need a specific structure, but we do need a process to produce governance of AI. And it was interesting, Jason was very prescient because six months after he made the recommendation, you had Sam Altman going in front of Congress calling for something. You actually had the Secretary General saying, we need an IAEA for AI. Exactly, Jason's point. So he really captured the zeitgeist. And I think the board was just trying to be careful not to get too far ahead of the institutionalization question and to speak more about the principles that should govern the AI question. What's nice about that is that has now been taken up. The tech envoy is now overseeing an independent um, AI advisory board that came out with a report early this year, and it's an interim report that really is trying to create guardrails for that AI governance question. And then there'll be another report later this year. I think the Global Digital Compact will be kind of compatible with that. But I think one of the most important questions that's raised in the HLAB report is how do you deal with a technology that becomes dangerous in a way that's very difficult to regulate in the traditional way? And a good way to think about this is the European Union passed some of the first legislation on AI. It's called the ACT. And they really treated it initially as a product, as an application. So you could think there's an AI that can diagnose cancer. What are the risks of that application? But the real risks of AI are come earlier in the process, in the treatment of foundation models, large language models, how those algorithms work. And they're very difficult to understand. Even the people that create them, after a while, it becomes too complex for them to do. So some of the really difficult questions comes to how do you govern something where by the time it's out in public, its risks are already potentially too late and already too embedded in our society. There's actually a funny kind of wonky term called a calling ridge dilemma, which describes the kind of risk that only appears once it's already too part of our li- too much part of our lives to regulate. And I think we're there with AI. But I do think that the board really put its finger on probably the most important technological question of the next five years or so. Didn't provide a definitive answer, but I think set a conversation going that's now really being taken up. The other two recommendations, uh, which we can touch on more if you'd like, is a little bit different than AI, but lethal autonomous weapons systems um, could pose an enormous risk if decision making is really taken out of human hands. The SG has frequently called for a ban on them. And I think the board said we need some sort of formalization of the regulation on these before it gets out of control. 
And then the final recommendation in the board report is a really reflection that transnational organized crime and transnational flows of illicit goods and, and people, the illicit flow of people, um, undermines governance and drives insecurity in a lot of parts of the world, and they need a kind of global strategy to deal with that. And so it calls for the creation of such a strategy without saying exactly what it should be. There's a great organization that has an office here in Geneva called the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime that is actually developing the contours of that strategy now. And so some of these things could be taken up and, and taken forward by other actors in, a, in an interesting way. But I think that package of issues really s is a way of the board saying there are certain trends and emerging risks that we can't deal with via traditional multilateral forum and institutions. So we need a more innovative approach to them. So we took a quite in-depth look at these six shifts in uh, part one, the first three, and part two, now the second three. As we looked at these shifts, they offered altogether an image and a set of issues that also show, in a way, how the entire multilateral setup we created after World War II has aged quite a lot. And so as we wrap up these part two of the episode, I wanted to ask you this question. Although the report is adamant that it's not proceeding from a disruptive um, kind of uh, point of view, and he sees the UN at the center of a more effective multilateralism in the future. And in the second, in this following sentence, the report itself says, and yet multilateralism has to evolve to be inclusive beyond states. So the question to you is, after coming out of this deep dive into the six ship, how feasible it is that this can be done within the boundaries, however improved, of the system we have today? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a very difficult starting point. And one of the most important ideas, I think, was in the book by Anne-Marie Slaughter, who was one of the high-level advisory board members. She wrote a book called The Chessboard and the Web, and really trying to move to that idea of a web approach to multilateralism, where there isn't necessarily a center per se. I mean, webs have centers, but much of the tension and the action happens outside of, of the center, and it's more about the relationships between actors and less about the formal institutions. And so I think that concept is extremely important, and I think some of the principles that are at the beginning of this report point us towards that more kind of web-like structure for multilateralism. I actually, my personal starting point is the UN isn't necessarily the center of many of the big global governance questions we have today. I don't think that the UN right now is the forum where member states are resolving most of the most important conflicts of today. It's often bilateral or regionally done or, or great power politics. That's unfortunate because that's what the UN was set up to do. I don't think that the UN is really the center of the AI question right now, although it's trying to shape a space for itself there through various initiatives, including what the tech envoy is up to. And I think there's a risk that if the, if the UN doesn't provide a clear value added or a forum for either resolution of conflicts or a common approach, it will quickly be even more marginalized. And so I think part of the underlying idea of a report like this is to resuscitate the value of the UN in a world where it's often not the main player. Certainly in the global financial architecture, it's very, very difficult for the UN to even exert minimal influence over the G20. And there could be some normative influence. But I do think we're at a moment where the traditional function of the UN as really a great power deconfliction device, it's not doing that function. So we need to rethink it or it will become irrelevant. And there's no guaranteed 100-year anniversary of the UN. It could be gone by then or it could be so marginalized that it's not worth talking about. I hope that that's not the case. And I think that you have two options. One is you keep doing business as usual and try and make the big institutions just function a little better. Or you have to maybe break some of them and break it open and do something different. What's interesting about the common agenda and what's interesting about the title of this report, also the idea of breakthrough, when we were working on the common agenda, there were initially an idea of having three scenarios for the future. You know, your worst case, your best case, and your most likely. That's your traditional way of doing it. And the SG's office and his leadership said, no, there's only two. If you keep doing business as usual, if you keep just trucking along and muddling through, you end up in a breakdown scenario is what the SG called it. So you need to break through. You need to do something radically different because all the other scenarios end up in kind of constant crisis management. And I think one of the key questions is how much can you do with the institutions you have now? 
how much do you need to let some of them just kind of go by the wayside? And I'll just, I'll close with one idea that we haven't talked about that's in the High Level Advisory Board report, which is an Article 109 UN Charter Conference. Now, the board mentions this in the context of UN Security Council reform, but essentially Article 109 of the UN Charter was a promise by big powers when creating the UN Charter that they would have a review conference within 10 years so that the lesser powers, and not only lesser in terms of their military power, obviously just as important, would have a chance to come back to the Charter. Now, that hasn't really happened. That's an unfulfilled promise. So one of the questions is, if we do want to break things open and have a much more far-reaching discussion, the seeds of that are actually formally in the Charter. Now, I think it may be dangerous to open up the Charter without a clear understanding of what you might want to get out of such a process. But, I mean, you know, you see Gaza happen, you see Ukraine happen, you start thinking, you know, this isn't working, and maybe we need to get further outside of the box. And certainly this is uh, very present in the minds of many of our listeners um, in this phase of international relations. And they can go back to the report and read through this report. I've been working for the UN for 30 years, and I can definitely say this is the most clear, the most mm -hmm. powerful, and the most compact way of digging through the key issues of multilaterals I have come across in my, in my career. So for all of you out there, a breakthrough for people and planet is an amazing report. Go and read it. You'll find the link in, in the notes of this episode and make your own opinion, you know, breakthrough or breakdown. Of course, there are many scenarios that are possible at this stage. I guess next step will be also the summit of the future. In any way, it will be, you know, uh, manifesting itself as a definite progress or a letdown. It will be a telling moment of uh, in our world of multilateral affairs. So thank you, Adam, for being with us for this episode in two parts, but one part two. And I want to remember, also recall that you were with us last year. There is an episode that we put out in May 23 that talks about the report in its entirety. So if part of you are not interested to deep dive into all of the shifts, you can go back to that episode and have a very good sense of the importance of this report. So thank you so much for taking the time for being with us. Thanks, Francesco. Great to be here. Thank you.